I would like, perhaps more formally now, to welcome you all to the Sydney Writers' Festival, and in particular this extraordinary session of cosmology and quantum physics, which is exactly what you need on a Saturday morning, yeah. especially if you've had a good night on a Friday night the evening before. Uh, my name is usually Fred Watson. Um, it, it, at the moment, it's a very croaky Fred Watson. Uh, this flu is a swine, isn't it? It really is a swine. <laughs> And um, uh, uh, so I'll do my best to, um, to speak in, uh, in uh, tones that you can actually understand. Many of you will know that my day job, or perhaps my night job, is uh, astronomer in charge of the Anglo-Australian Observatory at Coonabarabran, which is um, some five and a half hours drive from here. But in my spare time, I do things like this. <laughs> I don't know why, but I do. Um, and so um, I'm delighted to be here and very happy uh, that you're here too. I um, was at a talk about two years ago here in Sydney given by Sir Roger Penrose, who's perhaps one of the greatest living mathematicians of our era. And um, everybody in that talk, um, or in the audience, uh, turned off their mobile phones except Sir Roger Penrose. <laughs> and halfway through his lecture, his phone rang. So he took the call, and it was one of his colleagues in Cambridge, uh, and they had uh, an erudite mathematical discussion for about two minutes until he said, oh, I'm, um, I'm in the middle of a talk in Sydney, I've got to go. And the audience were very patient, we all just sat back and waited. But um, that's the kind of thing that happened. So um, uh, unless you feel like being Sir Roger Penrose, please turn off your, your phones. So this morning, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are very, very fortunate to have in our midst uh, the gentleman on my uh, right, whose name is Marcus Chown, who is uh, a writer, journalist and, dare I say, scientist uh, of some note. Uh, Marcus is perhaps best known for, uh, for his uh, pieces uh, uh, which are uh, of great interest to anybody with a cosmological background in the New Scientist magazine, but he's also the author of a number of books with titles like uh, The Afterglow of Creation, The Magic Furnace, The Universe Next Door, it's that way, The Never Ending Days of Being Dead, that sounds like one for me, does that? <laughs> And Felicity Frobisher and the Three-Headed Aldebaran Dust Devil, a serious work if ever there was one. And perhaps most recently this book, uh, Quantum Theory Cannot Hurt You, A Guide to the Universe, which is a cracking good read. Uh, so, Marcus, welcome to Sydney. Great Thank to be you here. for coming. Why did you call it Quantum Theory Cannot Hurt You? Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, not to scare people off. I mean, I, I write for my wife who is a nurse, and she doesn't have any science background. I mean, she has a medical background, but she doesn't know anything about physics or cosmology. So I really want people not to be scared about this stuff. I think that many scientists have done the public a disservice by saying things like, you know, nobody really understands quantum theory and, and, and all these kind of things. Uh, and I think that, you know, it is understandable. I mean, obviously you cannot have the kind of understanding that, you know, that Albert Einstein had or anything like that, but you can certainly get glimpses of this, this yes. fantastic theory. And did you choose the title, or was that um, chosen for you by a publicist? In I a... always choose the titles, <laughs> and it's always an incredible fight to have yeah. an incredible fight. Uh, I tend to take my titles from poetry. This actually comes from a, um, an Adrian Mitchell poem called Mashed Potatoes Cannot Hurt You. Um, <laughs> darling, sorry, Mashed Potatoes Cannot Hurt You, Darling. And I, and I fought like mad, and they cut the darling off the end, you know, so uh, they said that um, um, that wouldn't do for a science book. But, of course, you really want to, to, to make your book appear different. The Universe Next Door is an E. Cummings uh, oh, yes. poem. Yes. Um, so I, I find that poetry is, is, is a great place for titles. And uh, my wife and I, I mean, I, I, I drive her mad because we waste entire holidays going through poetry books, song titles, all kinds of things, trying to get a, a, a title. And a title is absolute key, you know, I mean, think of things like The Naked Ape, The Selfish Gene, Clockwork Orange, all these kind of things. They're fantastic titles. They are indeed. Or even Why Is Uranus Upside Down? Why Is Uranus <laughs> Upside Down? Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Which actually wasn't chosen by me at all. It was somebody else. But anyway, <laughs> so Quantum Theory Cannot Hurt You is actually rather more than just a book about quantum theory. In fact, I um, 
think this is two books in one. It is, yeah. Um, the first half is quantum theory and the second half is relativity, which as an astronomer I'm supposed to know something about. But I have to confess, and it may be that many of you are in the same boat, that quantum theory completely baffles me. <clears throat> and if I may, I'd like to read an excerpt yeah. from page 27, which is a good page to have. <laughs> it says, <clears throat> in experiments, it is actually possible to observe a photon, which is a particle of light, or an atom, which is a particle of matter, being in two places at once. The everyday equivalent of you being in San Francisco and Sydney at the same time. So what I want to know, Marcus, is who are you talking to in San Francisco right now? <laughs> No, it does sound pretty amazing, doesn't it? It's extraordinary. Um, in fact, oddly enough, we, we can't actually observe that. We can observe the consequences of an atom being in two places at once. Nature yeah. is quite clever about hiding this. But um, um, you can demonstrate this with, a, with a, uh, an experiment which was first done in 1801 in London by a guy called Thomas Young. It, and oddly enough, he, I walk past his house uh, nearly every day. It's only about oh, really? a quarter of a mile <laughs> from where I live. Uh, and he did an experiment um, where he... Uh, shone light of a single colour on, a, on an opaque screen with two parallel closely spaced slits in it. And the light went through both slits and the only thing you need to know is it, on the other side it mingled and in mingling it created this thing called an interference pattern which is kind of a, a pattern of light and dark uh, um, regions just like a, a supermarket barcode. And uh, the key thing you need to know is that, that this only happens if two things mingle. And in the 20th century, this, this experiment had a, a, another incarnation uh, when people fired particles of light. We, we, by then we discovered that light was actually a stream of particles, photons, at this opaque screen with the two slits in. And if this, this experiment is done where there are huge great time gaps between the, the, you know, the photons arriving, so they, they actually arrive at these two slits one at a time, you still get the interference pattern, as if that something was mingling with yes. something else. And the inference is that each of these photons goes through both of the slits at the same time. So it's in two places at once. If you try and determine which of the slits it goes through, the interference pattern vanishes. Nature does not permit you to know that, but you see the consequences of it. It's bizarre, isn't it? This process of... Um of when you measure a quantum effect, all the quantum effects disappear, is called decoherence, is that right? It's what yes. I suffer from on yes. Saturday mornings, <laughs> <Yeah>. usually. <coughs> I won't go into decoherence, but yeah, that, that is what it is. Uh, I, I thought it was called incoherence, actually. Because well, well, that's what we are. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, 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 yeah. The, 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 I mean, I should say, quantum theory is our very best description of the microscopic world of atoms. Um, and... You know, it's given us the modern world. It's given us lasers and computers and nuclear reactors. It tells us why this stage is solid, why, this, why, the, star, why the sun shines. Um, you know, so so it's, it's fantastically successful. Um, but it also gives us a window into this amazingly counterintuitive world, a kind of Alice in Wonderland world, which is beneath the skin of reality, um, where you know, an atom can be in two places at once, or three <laughs> places at once. Uh, where or things, everywhere at once. Where things happen for absolutely no reason at all. Or you know, an atom can communicate with another atom when they're separated by the width of the universe, and they can do that instantaneously. So the big puzzle is, why is the world, the, un the world that underlies our world, so different from the everyday world? And, and that, is a, that is a big puzzle. And as you say, decoherence is the, the phenomenon by which the quantum world kind of morphs into the everyday world. Yes, I understand. So um, I I'm interested in this concept of um, things happening for no reason at all, because I yes. think that's what happens in Canberra. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. It, but it, yeah. You know, it's, it, w what, it, <laughs> what it means is that um, our normal concepts of cause and effect essentially lose their meaning, don't they, in the quantum world. Um, that I I if things just happen spontaneously because they want to, yes. um, the, the normal phenomena of cause and effect vanish. That's right. I mean, if you take kind of two, I don't know, plutonium atoms, completely identical, or, or tell you, tell you, uranium oh. atoms, completely identical, one might disintegrate in the next second, and then the other one might disintegrate in five billion years' time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But if you looked at them, they're exactly the same. There's absolutely no difference. If you had two bombs, you know, that were completely, <clears throat> you know, two 
sticks of dynamite with timers and they were identical, yes. they would explode at the same you time. You would expect so. So, because this is the thing that deeply, deeply shocked Einstein. You know, he famously said, God does not play dice with the universe. Yes, you know, right. He thought there has to be something beneath quantum theory. You know, these things cannot happen for, for no reason. Now, you, you, know, you may wonder, how is it that the, that the microscopic building blocks of you and me behave in this random fashion and yet, everything in the everyday world is predictable. You know, we know that the sun, well, we hope that the sun will come up tomorrow and all these things. It might do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the reason is that kind of what nature uh, kind of uh, t takes away, it gradually, with one hand, it gradually gives back with the other. Because it turns out that although the fundamental un universe that underpins our, our, our world is unpredictable, the unpredictability is predictable. <laughs> So quantum theory, Work that one out. Quantum theory is, a predict, is, is, a, is a recipe for predicting the unpredictability. You know, so we can, we can know with certainty that something's got a 50% chance of happening or a 95% chance of happening or whatever. You know, that's something. It's, it's, it's a something. start. Yes, it's yeah. a start. Yeah. Um, but um, quantum theory, the theory of things happening on very small scales, as well as leading to all these curious paradoxes and, mm. and decoherences and things happening for no reason, also potentially give us some very exciting concepts like quantum entanglement and the potential of quantum computing, none of which I understand. Yeah. Do you? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is anybody else? <laughs> no, I, I, I kind of do, yeah. I mean, I think, I think, you know, this is a counterintuitive reality. It is. And we can't expect to, to, to you know, to completely visualise it. It's unvisualisable. But we can get glimpses, you know. Um, quantum computers you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, what I ought to actually say is that I lied to you and that quantum theory is not a theory of, of microscopic objects. It's not a theory of small things. It's actually a theory of isolated things. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's because it's possible to isolate something small like an atom from its surroundings that it behaves in this bizarre manner. Um, but, in principle, if we could isolate Fred from, the, from his surroundings, at the moment there are air molecules bouncing off him, there's photons of light bouncing off If we could put him in a vacuum chamber... Well, and we could do it all the time. Yeah, and we could completely <laughs> isolate him from his surroundings. He would behave like a quantum object. He would be able to go through two doors simultaneously and do all these incredible things. And that's, wow. of course, that's, that's what a quantum computer is. I mean, it's an attempt to build something big that is quantum, to exploit the ability of an atom to be in many places at once to do many calculations at once. And a quantum computer could massively outperform the fastest supercomputers we've yeah. got today. But the problem in building these things is they have to be isolated. You've got to build a big thing that's completely isolated from its surroundings. So they're, they're being built you know, in vacuum changes, chambers, and they're, they're cooled to minus 270 degrees, all this kind of stuff. But there's currently a race on in the world uh, you know, between militaries, and I don't know if you're building a quantum computer, are you? <laughs> we, we're doing things like that, you know. Yeah, universities, <laughs> uh, uh, governments, to try and build a quantum computer. Yeah, no, so it will, it will, one will probably, we will have one on a desktop uh, within, uh, you know, maybe 20 years. Currently, we've got kind of primitive quantum computers, and, and the biggest can manipulate something like about 10 binary bits. Yes. I mean, your computer at home can manipulate billions of bits, so they're very primitive. But they're not only a practical nuts and bolts device that you can put on a tabletop that behaves like a quantum object, but they have profound kind of philosophical implications for the nature of reality. Because it's very easy to imagine building a quantum computer within maybe uh, 20 years that can do more calculations simultaneously than there are particles in the universe. Yes. <laughs> and then you have to ask yourself, where is the quantum computer doing the calculations? I mean, your computer can only do, you know, it, it can store a, a number of a particular size because it's got the memory space. Where is the quantum computer doing the calculations if, it, if it's using more physical resources than mm. exist in our universe? And David Deutsch, who's a physicist at the University of Oxford, says that what the quantum computer does is exploits parallel realities, it exploits copies of itself in parallel universes. So when you set a quantum computer a problem, it splits into... Uh, multiple copies of itself in parallel realities, they all work on threads of the calculation and they come back together again with the answer. So he says the quantum computer is something entirely new under the sun. It's the first thing we've ever invented that exploits parallel universes. 
If parallel so, universes exist. If they exist. <laughs> I mean, the, you see, the, the interpretation of that double slit, the, you know, the, the, yes. the double slit experiment, where a photon appears to go through two slits at once. I mean, there are 13 possible interpretations of quantum theory. Um, and one of them is the, what we call the many worlds. So we explain the fact that the, the, the photon... Uh, you know, the photons appear to mingle with each other by saying that the photon goes through one of the slits and it mingles with another photon that went through the other slit in a parallel reality. And that's one possible explanation. And actually, it's embraced by a sizable minority of physicists, you know, yes, 50, it, yeah. 50 years after it was, it was suggested. So we, we face two possibilities. Either these parallel universes exist or the universe behaves as if they exist. And I think most physicists would say, the, you know, the universe behaves as if they exist. But, you know, I don't know which, which one you'd like to pick, you know. <laughs> well, uh, the concept of parallel universes, of course, has um, inferences when you look at things on very large scales, uh, which is, uh, in some senses, the other half of your book. Because the second part of your book, it, it's... It's really nicely done, ladies and gentlemen. That the first half is called very small things, the second half is called very big things, and I can understand that. It's quite, um, it's quite lame. <laughs> but on very big things, uh, we, uh, uh, your book Quantum Theory Cannot Hurt You looks at um, particularly uh, the uh, general theory of relativity, which um, Albert Einstein put together in 1915, or he published it in 1915. Um, and its consequences for our understanding of things on the very largest scale. And um, this, of course, for any astronomer is familiar territory because uh, the whole of astrophysics today is essentially built on Einstein's general theory of relativity and it has been demonstrated time and again uh, by the most stringent tests that can be thrown at it to be correct, it actually fits reality incredibly well. Um, and so explains things like the expansion of the universe and black holes and um, gravitational uh, uh, t um, warping of space and all the rest of it. That all comes out beautifully from general relativity. But it has an Achilles heel in the sense that it can't explain uh, the very small. General relativity re requires space to be smooth and not to be quantized or in small jumps. And so um, when you look at the, uh, the, the, the overall picture of the universe, you see things like black holes, which have what's called a singularity at their center, where um, um, basically space and time are compressed into a very unusual state. And when we look back in time, 13.7 billion years, which is before most of us were born, um, we see this phenomenon. We can actually see it still, the Big Bang, um, when, uh, when the universe was created. Now, both of those phenomena require an understanding of what happens on very small scales. And this is where relativity falls over. So, um, is there, um, to get to the point, I'm sorry, Marcus, I'm not giving you a chance to answer here, but um, is there, uh, in any sense, a way in which these notions of parallel universes can shed light on the, the, the impasse that you get when you try and make relativity apply to very small objects? Well, it's an interesting question. It's never occurred to me before, but... Uh, it's never occurred to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, there, there are several attempts, about, about three dif uh, different uh, ways that people are trying to unify the, very, the theory of the very small and the yeah. theory of the very big. And you've probably heard that one of the ones that's, that's got the most um, publicity is called string theory. And this is, this is the idea that the building blocks of matter are not tiny... Um, you know, tiny little bullets, but they're actually tiny little vibrating strings, like violin strings. Yes. And in this picture, uh, the heavy particles are kind of fast vibrating strings and the, the light particles are sluggishly vibrating. And this theory, unfortunately, does live in ten dimensions, you know. Uh, <laughs> Just nine... like we do. Yes. <laughs> so it kind of contradicts what we see around us. Um, so we, people have to postulate that six of these space dimensions are very small. So we haven't noticed them. So, uh, but anyway, the interesting thing about uh, this was uh, one, what the interesting thing about this theory is is that um, uh, we're trying to unite.
quite, it's a quantum theory. We're trying to unite it with Einstein's theory of gravity. And there is a particle in this theory that the, the little strings can actually be open-ended or they can be little string, they can join up and be string loops. And one of the vibrating string loops is a graviton. So it has all the properties of the particle that we think mediates gravity. You know, we think that there is actually a gravitational pull between the Earth and the, and the Moon because there are streams of gravitons moving backwards and forwards. We've never seen them, um, but that's what we think. So this, this theory is very, very attractive because it contains with it, with it, it's a quantum theory, and it contains within it a theory of gravity. But what no one tells you is that that theory of gravity is not necessarily general relativity. It yes. could be something else. <laughs> it could be another theory of gravity. But, but um, and, and there, there are several drawbacks with this theory. I mean, one of, the, one of the drawbacks is that the strings are very, very small, much smaller than atoms, and we're never likely to be able to actually see them directly. That, that's a bit of a problem. Um, so we can't actually test the theory in the laboratory. That's, that's, that's the problem. Another problem is there's all these extra dimensions, none of which we've seen. Um, but people did think this is a very elegant theory. One day we'll, 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 we'll sort it out and we'll be able to write these formulae, these equations on the back of a stamp and it'll explain everything. Unfortunately, we've suddenly discovered there are actually one followed by 500 zero string theories. <laughs> so what, they, what people say is each of these string theories is a different vacuum and a different vacuum uh, which leads to different forces, different forces of gravity, different forces of uh, you know, electric forces, different masses of particles. So there's this incredible um, um, multiverse of all these yes. universes, one followed by 500 zeros of them. So then we're faced with the question is, why are we in the one we're in and not in one of the others? So, uh, yes. Well, I, 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 actually, I've, I am in one of the others, <laughs> Marcus. It's only you that's in the one that you're in. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and all these other universes may be inaccessible to us. Yes. You know, um, all we can do is work out the conditions the, the, in all of these universes, and if we should be in one of the typical ones. Yes. If we're not in one of the typical ones, then the theory is wrong. That's, but but that, that's a bit of, bit of a, a worry. But uh, um, people did really, really hope that they would be able to write down a theory of everything which united quantum theory and Einstein's theory uh, without this kind of problem. But even Steven Weinberg, who's a Nobel Prize winner uh, for uh, his work in particle physics, physics and, and even wrote a book called Dreams of a Final Theory, even he has accepted now that we may not find such a theory. Um, and, of course, the reason is the cosmological constant, the dark energy, that's the reason. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, I'm glad you raised the dark energy. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sure many of you know that uh, about, in fact, 11 years ago it was, in 1998, uh, the discovery was made um, simultaneously almost by two research groups, one working here in Australia, led by Brian Schmidt, and the other working in the United States, led by Saul, Saul Perlmutter, Perlmutter. And they um, that basically uh, established that the universe, uh, whilst we know it's expanding, and we've known that since 1929, the expansion is actually accelerating, which was not known until 1998. And uh, the really interesting bit is that these theories that, uh, Marcus, uh, you're talking about, uh, su suggest that uh, the expansion is 10 to the power 120 times too small, uh, so that it should actually be blowing itself apart much more rapidly than it is. Uh, and uh, many people have described this as the worst prediction in physics, that the, uh, the universe is um, uh, expanding uh, at a rate 120 times smaller than it ought to be. Uh, what's your take on that? I mean, uh, you know, well, it, it just seemed like a big failure. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe 12 years ago, 13 years ago, Stephen Hawking said we'll have a you know, we'll have a theory of everything within you know, 10 years. Everything's going to be sewn up. This is, a re this is a statement that physicists have made going back into the Victorian times, and they've always got egg on their face, so it was a really stupid thing to say. And then, um, you know, almost immediately, this dark energy is discovered. It's the major mass component of the universe. It counts for 73% of the mass of the universe. I mean, we uh, atoms, uh, the kind of stuff that we're made of and that the stars and the planets are made of, counts for just 4%. And we've only seen half of that. Mm -hmm. So really, we, 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 you know, 98% of the universe is invisible. We know that 23% is dark matter, invisible stuff that, that has gravity, that you know, tugs on the visible stuff, but we don't know what it is. And 73%, we, we completely missed until 1998. <laughs> it's and it's kind of... <laughs> and we, we kind of... 
yeah, as you say, we found that these, these distant supernovae are, are moving away far too fast. It's as if um, empty space is kind of springy. It's got actually repulsive gravity. So incredibly, most of the stuff in the universe actually has repulsive gravity. It's kind of blowing rather than sucking, you know. <laughs> we think of gravity as something that's attractive, but most of it is, is, is uh, blowing. And as, as, as you point out, uh, quantum theory is our very best description, our best physical theory we've ever devised. Uh, and, uh, and as I say, we know it's right because it predicts the outcome of every experiment to an obscene number of decimal places. And yet when it comes to predict the energy of empty space, as Fred points out, it overestimates it by a factor of 1 followed by 120 zeros, <laughs> which kind of tells you there's something desperately, desperately wrong there. Yeah. Uh, but there's more than one dark energy problem. Um, you know, it's not simply that physics is completely at sea uh, trying to, to uh, you know, explain this stuff. There's the problem that, that dark energy is this weird stuff. Um, it's a property of empty space. So if you double the amount of empty space, you get twice as much dark energy. It's twice as springy. Uh, you know, so this is why, for instance, there's dark energy in this room but its, its repulsive effect is too small, and you need to get over vast, vast scales. So when you get large amounts of it, then it's got an appreciable uh, repulsion. Well, of course, we, we, we are pretty certain that the universe began 13.7 billion years ago in a Big Bang. Uh, so it started off very small. There was very little empty space. So there was very little dark energy. So it had no effect whatsoever very early on. And as the universe has grown and grown and grown, you've got more and more dark energy, it's become more and more important. So the mystery is, why has it become important today? Because it's only just today, or certainly in the last billion or so years, that the dark energy has suddenly got strong enough to overcome uh, the gravity pulling all the galaxies together. I mean, it could have happened at any time. So why are we around at the exact moment when dark yeah. energy takes control of the universe. So this is a second mystery. We don't really know the answer to that one either. <laughs> um, we, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, um, astronomers are doing is trying to look back in time. And of course, as, as astronomers look out into space, they automatically uh, look back in time. Um, you all know that when you see the sun, you're looking back eight minutes. When you see the nearest star, you're looking back four years. Uh, the, the nearest big galaxy, you're looking back two billion years. When you um, look at Marcus and I, you're looking straight back to the 1960s. Uh, that, that's a, there you are, I'm getting a bit grey. Yeah, yeah, right. it's, it's a different issue. But, but of course, when you look further out into space, you can, uh, you can see further back in time. And one of the challenges that faces modern astronomers is to try and uh, investigate the geometry of the universe, perhaps four or five billion years ago, by looking at uh, galaxies in very large numbers, and galaxies are huge aggregations of hundreds of billions of stars and dark matter and dust and gas and all the rest of it. But one of the things that we hope to achieve in the next decade is to probe the geometry of the universe perhaps five billion years ago, four or five billion years ago, which will give us a direct measurement of the springiness of the universe then and allow exactly this question that you've raised to be, to be addressed, whether it is now that the dark energy has become significant or whether it happened four or mm. five billion years ago, um, which may actually give us some insight into what dark energy is, uh, yes. because at the moment we are really grasping at straws, I think is the fairest way to say. We are. I mean, it's very interesting because I told you that we, we, we know that the you know, we, we, there is a standard Big Bang theory. You know, I mean, we know, we're pretty certain that the universe began in a hot, dense, compact phase, uh, a fireball, and it expanded and, uh, and, and has been cooling and the, and the galaxies have been uh, you know, congealing out of the cooling debris ever since. But in, in quite a few major ways, that standard picture contradicts what we actually observe. I mean, that picture predicts that the galaxies, which are kind of like um, uh, pieces of cosmic shrapnel, um, they're, they're, they're under each other's mutual gravity, and, and so the expa they should be, this expansion should be Break. Breaking, they should be slowing right, down. Yeah. The dark energy shows that that's not happening. Uh, they're speeding up. Um, and there are other things like um, we, the standard picture of the Big Bang says that we, we aren't here. We cannot be here because... <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> the, the, because there isn't, hasn't been enough 13.7 billion years that there's not been enough time for the debris of the Big Bang to congeal or, or into... Under, under the force of gravity into galaxies like our Milky Way. So the standard picture predicts that we should not be here. 
what we do is we say, oh, there's a lot of missing stuff. You know, there's all this matter out there, and it's completely dark. Um, we can't see it, but it's got gravity, and its gravity speeds everything up. And there's another more technical reason why the Big Bang doesn't work. So we have to tag on this kind of period of super fast inflation in the first split second of, second, first split second of the universe.